I am learning as I'm going, people. Bear with me. Right. The agenda is short and sweet today. At two o'clock, we I welcome you, and at three o'clock, we will finish. So, um, <laughs> um, please, I, we've got a few questions. We've got to kick off uh, our conversations with. I've, had, I've received a few questions um, through emails. Hopefully, I'll be pulling those people in. Um, but if you think of, you want to try and make this as fluid as possible. So, if you do have any questions during the chat or that you'd like to probe further, please use the chat function um, and then I can field them and pass them on to you and ask them at the appropriate time. I was also trying to think of a system. It would be really, really nice if people could ask the questions themselves. So it does mean that you need to be a bit brave, possibly switch your camera on and scare us with, your, with the close-up of your face. <laughs> Um, and you can ask it yourself. If not, I'm more than happy. So my little system, about 20 minutes ago, put yes at the start, or put no, and then I know to bring you in, or just ask the question on your behalf. Uh, we have, oh gosh, I'm just trying to, oh, my screen's gone all a bit weird at the moment. Okay, uh, right. So, yeah, welcome everybody to our, what's official word um, Jude, the lockdown design lectures Q&A session with Jude Pullen sponsored by Product Design Banker. We always go for the nice and short catchy title. Um, so I don't know Jude, I'll, let's, let's get the ball rolling. Um, Indeed. So I, I checked my emails, it was the 1st of April that my first email to you to kind of kind of do something. <laughs> I think it's the 27th today. So I think we've moved pretty fast over the last few weeks. So you, you definitely have. Um, so, and I'm always, always interested in other uh, people's process and how they work and what, what they do and how they did it. So I think, because I think the, the three videos that are up already, I think are cracking. I thoroughly enjoyed them. So again, thank you very much for those. Um, I think you mentioned that the viewing figures were good on them as well. So. The, yeah. word is, the word is getting around. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, just take us back. What's, what's your process been? Um, how did you work? How have you adapted in the last few weeks or possibly done something different? And just take it from there, really. So, yeah. if people, if you think of a question, get on your chat and I'll, um, I'll dive in after you talks. So yeah, I guess I guess it's one of those things where often, you know, uh, for those of you who've seen me before at Bangor University at the design conference in the past few years, there's always this sense of like, okay, I'm I'm turning up with this nice polished keynote series. Uh, whereas this, it wasn't that I didn't try to polish it. It's just quite simply from Peridor saying, go, we, we, we've agreed to sign this off at the university to actually it's starting uh, earlier last week. This is this has basically been about two weeks of work. So it's quite extraordinary to sort of live and die by what I supposedly preach about uh, quick prototypes, not caring too much, 80-20 rule, all that sort of stuff. So this is a really nice situation where I sort of feel like I, I have at least been, should we say, honest with people. And I've tried to ask a little forgiveness if it isn't quite as polished as the usual standard. But I think the flip side is it happened fast. Uh, you can have it in two weeks or you can have it in two months. And really all that was going to change is I was probably going to get some copyright signed off with the images and maybe I would have, you know, done a few things differently. But ultimately, I think this is still living to the spirit. So I guess if anyone's curious, all I did was basically just make a bunch of notes, uh, which I, it sounds really sort of clunky, but I basically sketched out what I thought each lecture would be. And some are a little bit more graphic than others. Uh, that I was almost just trying to sort of visualize this and understand the stages. And this will probably resonate with some of you who've actually watched the first three videos or sneak preview on the next series. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, it was, it was funny that this wasn't my first rodeo of working remotely. Um, I've done a fair bit as a technology scout for Lego. So it's not even just that they're in Denmark and I'm in the UK but I was often traveling as far as places like Japan or whatever. And so often you end up sort of communicating with things like this. And this was a, a graph for Peridor to explain the emotional journey that I think I'm taking people through on this lecture series. And so it's just been really fun to sort of reevaluate how all of this would make sense to all you guys, 
uh, having to go through this. And, and indeed, it's not that I, if I come across as maybe overly optimistic or over, overly upbeat, it's really just trying to, you know, do that with the best of intentions. Uh, certainly as a freelancer, I don't have full-time employment. So I'm, I'm acutely feeling some problems myself, but I think it's, uh, you know, if, if life teaches you anything, it's to remain positive in these times. So um, that's certainly how Peridor and myself have gone forward into this. And uh, I hope that's shone through in, in some places that it has been a huge amount of fun uh, working with Bangor University on this. So I hope you've enjoyed thus far. Thank you. Um, I don't know, feel free people if you want to dive in. Um, otherwise you're just going to hear me asking my random questions uh, to Jude. Um, so, amazingly, we have 38 people. So, uh, I mean, what do you do? Do you offer a Kit Kat that will be posted to the... <laughs> <laughs> if, if you've got stock of Kit Kats where you are, Jude, I think um, you're doing pretty That's well. That's it. So um, go, go, go out, and, uh, out and buy them. Um, That's it. If we come out of this, Kit Kats for the best questions. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll put my... I'll, 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 put, I'll, that. I'll spot that one, yeah. <laughs> um, I... Because another thing, because we, we, we talked earlier really as well, how we probably thought that we were doing a lot of online working and collaboration before this situation kicked in. Um, mm -hmm. But in the light of the way that we've been working over the last few weeks, I, I don't think we would even scratch the surface on it. And I think there's still way for us to go um, within our organization anyway, to kind of streamline stuff and work better in an online sense. Um, I think we've, we've shifted what we used to do previously into a digital virtual world, but doing exactly the same thing. And I think sometimes that doesn't work. Um, so, so I'm just thinking, how, how do you, do you cause obviously you're a freelancer as well, and this is probably more in your realm, but how do you think this is going to change the way, I don't know, people are working or people's expectations are going to be different? I don't know if you just want to explore that a bit, bit more. Well, Hopefully, the question will arrive. Indeed, and, and I kind of feel that's the, that's really been the interesting thing about this, is that even, even when all of this whole lockdown thing started, uh, I was working with a startup on a project where I was prototyping stuff with them. And we were doing this up at uh, a facility called Building Blocks, which is essentially like a huge... Uh, sort of abandoned factory that's been converted into like a maker space makes it sound very you know sort of hammers and chisels but this is like full you know CNC milling it's got textile rooms everything and so we were up there prototyping then you know the next generation the future of their stuff and then of course all the lockdown hit and so we had to we had to basically decamp and what was quite surprising is that we managed to sort of still stay on track with the project. Um, and the, the, the funny thing, as you can see in here, I mean, this isn't actually a lavish shed, but there's a, a lot of this, it, it's surprising the amount of stuff that we could still get in from Amazon. And that obviously I've got some basic hand tools and things like this to help build the prototype, a little 3D printer. And so it's quite extraordinary to be able to just think, right, this is all going crazy, but we can order materials quickly. We had a sort of last minute panic for any sort of little widgets and tools that we could pick up from individual workshops before lockdown really tightened its grip. And then, you know, we, we started jokingly using this phrase of distributed sheds, of that there was me and two other people working on this. And we'd basically, you know, you can appreciate it's a rubbish story because I'm having to be very confidential about this. But I was developing something that lent itself to my skill set. I was talking to another guy who did his bit we would, you know, and you might be thinking, oh, did we use big high powered sort of CAD servers and things like this? No, quite often it was just as some sketches on paper, um, taking a few photos of where we got to and indeed videoing a lot and just uploading to sort of things like WhatsApp. And if any of you guys have used it, uh, we were using Slack. Um, although, you know, I could also mention other projects that I've been working on to do with sort of uh, COVID ventilators face masks where we were using Microsoft Teams. And so it sounds silly that I remember when I was a student, people would put, you know, on their CV, good, competent at Microsoft Office and InDesign and all these sorts of things and Creative Suite by Adobe. And actually, I think ironically, 
people need to put, I know how to use Microsoft Teams, I know how to use Zoom to an advanced level where you know how to use breakout rooms and things like this. Um, and I think i have been using Slack ever since the days when I was doing work with BBC. Um, and so it's quite extraordinary to sort of see that actually all of this stuff that I thought was a bit of a sort of nice to have became absolutely critical uh, to dealing with the current situation. Um, and I would say that, yes, I enjoyed learning how to use Slack in less stressful times. But at the same time, the pressure of making a TV show is still pretty stressful. So I'd say Slack is free. Microsoft Teams is free. If you want to do a little project uh, between yourselves or indeed finish your university project, I think it's absolutely tremendous. And I'm even part of Slack groups. Uh, there's one which is called Liminal, which is a big network of sort of uh, creative thinkers and innovators, which I'm really, really enjoying being part of that community. So I would say as much as COVID is most certainly forcing my hand and indeed everyone else's, um, I'd say there's a little bit of trying to embrace that dynamic in the best possible way. So um, I'd say that would, that would be one answer to it. I haven't seen whether any questions have popped up. Uh, we've, we've received one. So okay, I'm gonna, lovely. I'm going <clears> to <throat> weave this in one nicely now. So um, and I don't know if the person wants to ask it in themselves. I don't know if they just want to put a yes or a no. Oh, a go on, be brave. But, ask away um, on video. I think... So we've had three lectures so far, and in a way, the reason this Q and A now is that those three kind of fit together, um, and then obviously there's another set of four coming um, later on, um, and it is about prototyping. So I'm, I'm going to go. Well, I've got I'm, I'm spoiled for choice now, so I'm going to bring Peter in first. So Peter Harris, he's keen. Ah, here we go. Right over to you, Peter, Hi, to ask you a question. Hi, Jude. Hey, how's it going, Peter? It's good, thanks. Yeah, I've, um, so I, I watched the first of your videos on YouTube. Um, so about the rough and ready prototyping. Yeah, could you give a little bit of your background? Are you a student at the minute? Uh, no, not at the moment. I'm a maker. I'm a okay. For uh, theatre and. Oh, wonderful. So that so I've I was working with the. Um, War of the Worlds guys in London uh, making stuff for the uh, show, which is a mixture of live action and uh, VR and things like that. But um, yeah, no, I was wondering, I really like the idea of making the rough and ready prototypes so you can get a feel for an object and uh, rather than the 3D uh, using technology, as you, you said yourself. Um, but I think in this environment, um, would it be, it's, it's quite a good thing if we could sort of tell the client if they could make the object for us where they are, mm. <laughs> household items which are accessible to them. So the way I worded it was, it was a bit like when they were trying to solve the Apollo 13 problem. Oh, that is... Yeah, what a scene, right? <laughs> yeah, so they were using like the front cover of the mm. manual to try and put the adapter together in space because obviously you can't go down the store to go and get the thing you need. They certainly couldn't. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it may be a really good way of engaging clients because they actually get to make this thing um and you get that valid feedback of where what you're thinking of the product mm -hmm. and what their impression of the product is so i wondered if you know i suppose you've got to pick things which everybody's got right now um so things like pens and toilet roll <laughs> yeah i mean i guess uh it's, it's worth sort of mentioning uh you you, you mentioned the um the series. Let me just quickly share screen because I just want to be sensitive to anyone who uh, has has not seen the lectures. Yeah. But hopefully uh, we can share this. So can you see this? That's it. Yeah. Okay. So this this was a really nice example of how uh, this is a whiteboard marker and a thirty five millimeter film canister for all the old people like myself and a clothes peg. Um, and this was an example from IDO of using, you know, nothing more than a bit of tape to bring these things together to, to later discuss, uh, you know, the journey of creating this, this final product. And so 
I think what I was trying to say <clears throat> was was really the, the, the tricky bit that sometimes gets lost in the wash with these stories when you put them in the presentation is that the, the designers from IDO will have done quite a lot to carefully frame this because otherwise, you know, it can feel very amateur. And especially if you're trying to draw a serious salary uh, or indeed a, a freelance gig and, and ask for, you know, decent sums of money, that if you're saying, hey guys, can you go get some blue tack and some lollipop sticks? It might feel a bit like, well, what are we paying you for? Yeah. But, it, but I, I've honestly gone through this journey with my family, a project of getting, uh, you know, consultant anesthetists to get busy with a little ball of Play-Doh, as I mentioned, and, and squish something together and say, I kind of want it to look like this. And it doesn't matter that it's imperfect. It, it represents the design intent. And I think that that is the phrasing I would use to a client is you're not trying to create the prototype for me to do my job. You're trying to show me the intent of what is critical and what is nice to have and what is frankly an irritation or a pain point. So, you know, mm -hmm. if, if they made something and said, look, this, this thing just never works. Look, I, I can't fit my thumb all the way through. It, it's only this far, it needs to be twice as big a diameter then suddenly that becomes very obvious. And then you can say to them afterwards, could you just measure that diameter, please? And they go, oh, yeah. yeah, well. That, that's exactly it. Yeah, it's that thing of like um, not having to be like imagining whether you can fit your hand around something or your, you know, does it uh, obstruct something else in the way you want, want to use the tool? <laughs> That you're making that it makes something else harder and as long as you pick things that they definitely got <laughs> that's the thing i suppose there's the there's the challenge it has to be even more everyday items uh, well i think to... i think that's the really exciting thing is that if i was a company that let, let's let's just be really real about this uh most most of the contracts i take are uh, you know, a min a starting price of like four figures right so if you consider a 3d printer is you know 150 quid uh and the software you can use it, it it means that potentially if you've got someone who's even reasonably technically competent you could do all the design work send them the files use something like zoom or, or skype or whatever to walk them through how to 3d print it they can pick it off the bed and be like oh my gosh you're right i uh, it does feel terrible or it does feel amazing and maybe I can put it on my head or whatever, all these sorts of things. Yeah, um, I didn't think of that. Of course, now we have this. We have this sort of ability. And personally, I've just started to look into 3D printers again because I think I looked at them a few years ago and the costs may be prohibitive. But now I've just seen like a highly rated 3D printer for £250. Yep. You know, and everybody's raving about this one. And it's... You're welcome to say what it is. We're not sponsored here. If it's a genuine recommendation, <laughs> it's a genuine recommendation. So, yeah, it was, I looked through all the reviews and it was the Monoprice Voxel. Yeah. And it's an enclosed printer, which I think is really good for a lot for of the people. fumes. Yeah, fumes and uh, in, because <clears> I do a lot of sort of uh, dusty work as well. So I don't want that going into the, printer area even though i've got very small workshops so uh yeah i i just think it's maybe come of age and and that is just the perfect scenario where you can send the print to the the person yeah. then you've got that professionalism as well to the the result yeah. that you're gonna give them to try out so i mean really you're, you're talking you know possibly five percent of the actual project cost to, to say can you just please buy a 3d printer because it's yeah. going to help facilitate our discussions. I kind of think that's a no brainer, but I'd, I would still always come back to the point of how much stuff can you get done with plasticine, uh, with cornflake boxes, with things that, you know, actually are quite universal. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I've, you know, obviously I wax lyrical about the potential of cardboard. And I think of course that is a constraint that if people feel that they can't work to that level without a bit of practice, but I think that's where the 3D printer obviously does do a bit of magic because you don't have to have the physical skill to, mm. to build it. You just need a little bit of a go. But yeah. um, yeah, I'm I mean, aware Peridot is flashing at me on the screen. So maybe <laughs> I should, uh, yeah, have a little, have a different question. Yeah, yeah. But I'm thanks sorry. so much. I really appreciate your, your time feeder. Yeah, sure. uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um,
Right, uh, we've got this. This will tie in quite nicely, really. Um, so Daisy yep. Pope, I'm gonna I'm gonna call on Daisy. She's got a, a question for us. I'm gonna steal what Jude did, obviously. Um, if it would be a good idea, but for you, if you could introduce yourself and tell us what, what was that game show, who you are, and where you come from, and what you what you know. <laughs> so Daisy, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Daisy. I'm doing a master's degree in product design at the minute. And um, my question is um, like halfway through the degree, I've built prototypes that I'm designing something for amputees to use. And now I need to do user testing, but obviously with the lockdown, I can't meet anyone. So do you have any advice or ideas of how you can do user testing without meeting with your user? Gosh, so could you, it's, it's not that I, couldn't give a quick fire thing, but I'm trying to be specific of it. Could you give a little bit of detail without breaching confidentiality, of course, because we're recording, but anything, what is it that you're needing to test? Like what's the question in the prosthetic or the, the example? Um, I'm designing a liner that goes, it's like, um, breaches the interface between a residual limb and a prosthetic socket. Mm -hmm. So I need to do pressure testing and, you know, things like that, friction testing. Um, and I don't have the facilities to do that at home. So yep. as well as having access to someone that could test it. So I wondered if you'd ever come across that or if you had any advice for that. So, yeah, of. and I, I think if I'm getting, getting the idea right, having worked with this, is that is it that you've got a socket which is fitting over, say, a stump, as it's called? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and so it has this need to be not too frictiony as it chafes, but not too loose or it slips off. Yeah. yeah. And so have you, have you got samples of the materials or are those all in warehouses and unavailable? Yeah, I've made prototypes at home. I've just made some, yeah, they're out of silicone. I've just yeah. made some silicone prototypes, but they're flat. They're not like the same kind of shape as a liner would be because again, yeah. I don't have like the manufacturing capabilities at home with it. Um, but yeah, it was just how, what kind of testing could, you know, maybe you could do to emulate it. I mean, gosh, this is this is like one of the trickiest, as I, yeah. I'm not going to lie, because you've got a very organic tailored shape. This isn't like saying, hey, can you make something fit on a pen, which mm -hmm. is a very simple set of dimensions to communicate digitally or online. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's the, although I could sort of glibly say there's 3D scanning software where you could scan the stump with someone's phone and it does exist. Uh, the resolution and the accuracy of that would be low, but yeah. um, there's definitely one called Clone, spelled Q U Q L O N E, I think it is. Okay. Um, and there's a few others which would at least mean they could have a crack at just giving you something to work with. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I, I would say also try and steal. And, and and I think this is for anyone listening, thinking, "Ah, oh, prosthetics doesn't apply to me. I'm bored." I, I would say actually the the, the thing that always feels quite universal of this, once you've built a bit of experience, is often I don't go into something going, I know exactly what to do, but I look at what other industries have already figured this problem out. And I would say tailoring has already fi figured this out, right? Mm -hmm. You know, even something as simple as you don't have to 3D scan, what you could do is you could take a picture of their stump, ask them to take it on a piece of A4 with a ruler next to it, mm -hmm so that you've got perfect scale and I did this with Kyle I got him to take a picture like that a picture like that and also he had various movements that he could and couldn't do and so again I had that as a grid reference I pulled that into solid works and then because I've got it on the xyz planes I was able to approximate the 3d shape now it won't be perfect but it will get you 80 percent of the way yeah. And, and then as soon as you start getting into things like the diameter, which might be variable, then you could start saying, I want you to draw a black marker on there and a black marker there and measure the distance mm -hmm. and then tell me that using a, uh, you know, a bendy tape measure that, that a seamstress would use or a seam master, yeah. forgive me. Um, but, but, but I think that's the way is like, if you, if you look at how things are done in tailoring, be it clothes, be it shoes, Mm. They work all the time with building things around people's bodies that have to be perfect when the person is not in the room. Mm. So I'd also Google things like lasts 
which are which are the the dummy feet the ta the, the shoemakers and i think often i feel even though i haven't got a quick fire answer i actually have enough faith in you as a designer just having gone through this amount of your course that i guarantee you if you look at those industries you'll suddenly have the epiphany yourself and be like that's how i'm gonna do it so so i i would say that that for me has always been the go-to is steal and take reference from other industries that have already figured out the hard bit because you know again i i, I think those are good examples of where offline prototyping is essentially what a tailor does Mm-hmm. And, and and it does mean that if you if you can design it so that you could flat pack it and post it it will take seven to ten days i'm noticing yeah. royal mail takes about that long at the minute but that's that's not insufferable if you're mm-hmm. quick mm-hmm. you know you could put together some sort of paper origami type thing and go does this work for you yeah. but i think yeah friction testing that would be a hard one to approximate but you could still get a long way with your skin your, mm-hmm. yourself you could still just test things yeah. and ask for samples and indeed i've been actually amazed that as much as companies have technically gone to lockdown there's quite often a lot of people who still are in the factory and don't mind shipping out something mm-hmm. through royal mail and, and and honestly i've just literally done that the other week is just said pretty please if it's no risk to you if you're in there anyway would you send out a couple of bits and i think that isn't that isn't sort of uh, breaching the government's advice uh, I think it is still being responsible that if they're just, you know, you know, quite quite a lot of these companies are a bit mom and pop business. Mm-hmm. And so they're actually by the shed or by the store warehouse anyway. So I hope that's a workaround. Yeah. Um, but it is tricky. That certainly yeah. is tricky. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. Right. I'm going to bring my uh, colleague, my esteemed colleague, Alan. He's got a question. I do a quick question for you here. Um, hey. you, you may recall, um, oh, when was it? Was it this year, last year or the year before, when Richard Seal, uh, Seymour Powell came over to our design conference? And he, yeah. he was that fantastic demo of his sort of virtual design, uh, virtual reality design environments. And he was sort of, you know, with the car and the, well, you've probably seen it on, on YouTube and uh, oh, it's incredible. Uh, TED Talk, yeah. actually. Um, so is there any more developments there, June? Have you come across any, any sort of further use of, those des- uh, virtual reality sort of design environments since then, or used one or heard of one or sort of know so, somebody using it? I don't know. It's a, it's a tricky one. So as I mentioned with Daisy, there's definitely some incredible free software where you can scan something and it'll pull a file into your fo- phone and create, you know, something like a, a, an IGIS or a STL or that sort of thing. Um, I would still say it's a little bit to sort of what, to what purposes. Are you doing it? I think if you're trying to create a, a, a big experience that's completely novel and unique, um, it probably sounds like it's a lot of development. But at the same time, I kind of feel there's a lot of interesting spaces that are, are happening around the sort of augmented reality. So Apple's AR core, all those sorts of platforms, those are quite interesting to play around with. But I guess if I'm keeping it to sort of Bangor product design students, there's probably quite a bit of learning curve that you'd have to go through to get to the level where you can actually tinker with those. Um, Though I'm sure there's sort of hacks and workarounds. I guess the biggest question I found looking at all things AR, and you can appreciate, you know, that there's there's many companies that have looked into this and and the toy industry is a really exciting one because it plays with these things. I, I would actually say that often the precursor to big earth shattering innovations is often they start off as little playful things before they they fully mature so so i think it'd be one of those things where um the exhibition by bjork at somerset house was something that really stayed with me and that was she was creating an immersive experience in vr where you could interact with uh, all sorts of objects as you were listening to her music and it wasn't just playing a track in stereo it was it was responding to where you were in physical space and so i guess my advice to sort of make it honest for the whole COVID thing was um, if anyone's not familiar with these terms of Wizard of Oz or Faker type, these sorts of things, I would say you don't actually have to build an entire 3D space in, in Unity, let's say, mm-hmm. uh, overnight. It is that you could do a long way with putting together even as something as simple as a PowerPoint and using still images to just explain what, what the excitement or the opportunity is. 
and then indeed look for funding or look for a backer to run with it. But I would say, you know, if I learned anything at Lego, they, they certainly don't just say, we want to develop something that's billions of pounds worth of, of tech. Let's just do that on day one. You, you work up slowly from lots of prototypes. So I'd say, you know, emulating the experience, I think would be the key first step, even before you get anywhere near Unity or any of these sorts of things. But I would say Unity is an incredible, uh, you know, low entry for people who have some aptitude of 3D modeling and code. Um, definitely that would be one to, if I, if I was gonna hunker down and learn a new skill, I think that would be in the, the top 10 for sure. Thank you, Jude, thanks. Right, this is going quite good. I'm gonna try something now so I might just fall <laughs> flat, right. <laughs> I was aware that it's been about halfway through. Um, so I just need to, uh, I've got a poll. We're going to try and be interactive. I've mentioned we go big, so I'm going to launch a poll. They're not serious questions, people. It's just to make sure that you're still there and not sleeping. Uh, there will be four questions, and then I can release the, the answers. So here we go. Launch polling. Let's see if this works. You should. Do I do this as well? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There should be a pop-up. And I'm, I'm going to share this for people at home if I can. Because I think, I'll see whether I can. Because if anyone viewing this can see it, I thought this would be kind of cool just for anyone watching the video. So we got these questions. There we go. Stop sharing. Number four, that's, that's, that's a bit dark there, Porridge. <laughs> <laughs> so do you get a fancy graph for all this? I've got no idea. Um, I hope I get something. This is all very exciting, new technology for granddads like us. 83% is voted. I think we're allowed a couple of percent that might be asleep. <laughs> I do have that effect on people. 88%. There was no option for a Glen Fiddick there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Right, I'll give it an, another 10 seconds. If you can make your choices, please, people. I realised I had to go back to a mug because I was, I was doing one Zoom cast where I had honey and water because it's good for the throat if you're talking a lot. And I realised it looked like a scotch in a, in a glass. <laughs> so, and then like that measure of it as well. Ooh, 95% voted. Right, That's pretty good. Sure the last two people. I need the countdown theme, uh, theme tune. Right, that's it. I'd say call it three, that. Two, one. That's ninety-five percent consciousness is pretty good for, a, for what I was expecting. Uh, right, share results. You should get the results, Ooh. people. Oh, okay. I don't know what this tells us. It's not scientific by any means, but <clears throat> old school sketching. <clears throat> Solid works. You see where you voted on that cardal? Is it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no card for me. There you go. You see, there we go. So, how do we want to do this? This is in the darkness. Tea, coffee, Red Bull. I was hoping to get like 96% Red Bull and then get them to sponsor us in the next one or something, but we do it. That's all right. Well, it's tea, and I have to say, I, I would love some twinings. <laughs> and I believe uh, Stephen Fry's done very well off that, so I'm, I'm happy to go the same way. Right, I'm going to stop sharing that now. Okay. Hey, that's gone. Right. Well, that, that was quite interesting in that uh, I was actually surprised at the, the lack of Max. And uh, I, think, I think people won't mind me saying this, as I think it was just a, a truth, should we say, is that uh, a, a, lot, a lot of the dyslexics were known to be equipped with a Mac. So uh, I was one of those people um, at, at our university. So I think it almost ushered in uh, a prevalence in Max in our course. <laughs> but so, so I wonder whether you don't have the support or whether people have still opted for, for PC, but that's, 
I, I personally love using both actually. I think it's just one of those things where Windows is definitely caught up. Um, yeah. But yeah, but it seems like there's, I'm glad some people were saying old school prototyping. Um, digital was getting some good votes, but I think you, you know it's a, it's a trick question because obviously both are valid, you know. Absolutely. Uh, right, I'm going to bring in Emily. Emily, I hope you're still with us. Emily's got a question for us. So she's going to be brave enough. Here we go. Camera's on. Mute Hello. Us off. Hi. Um, I'm a first year student at Bangi Uni. I was just wondering from various models you've made, have you ever ended up starting to use a material and found out it's probably harder to use than you thought? Uh, Absolutely. And, and I think sometimes that that's sort of almost the, the journey is that you, you realize you maybe fail in using it in one way and then you just you got to park it and sometimes try a different one. But I find it so often that I come back to it and then think, oh, but this would be perfect for the for another project. And I guess maybe to give a tangible example of this is uh, before I worked at Sugru, I said, oh, you know, I was really excited about it. Um, and I knew at Dyson, it would be really, really helpful to use it for creating seals around various ducting. And then I got some and I realized it was actually really, really hard to model with. You have to be quite expert to use Sugru. Uh, as much as, you know, it, it claims to be like plasticine, it's actually a little bit more, a bit more soggy in places and you can't uh, work it quite as easily. Um, but what happened was it then, stayed on my desk for about three months and I sort of just couldn't figure out what to do with it. And then I realized it was absolutely amazing for creating these sort of good tactile coverings. So, you know, if you've got like drills or uh, like a hammer here where you can see that it's got the rubbery coating, it's really good if you just mock some up and, and put it on for that and you can mold it into different shapes really quickly. So it was actually the, the failure that made me understand the limitations, but then sometimes I think I think the the lesson of the story is it's better to have played around with some material, had it go a bit wrong, but then it's almost like your hands and your brain remember something that was positive. Um, so I don't know if you've come across the Institute of Making in London, but if you ever get a chance to go on a, a visit there, maybe after all this is blown over, but indeed check out the website because it's doing a lot online. But, you know, Zoe Lachlan's... Uh, philosophy is is definitely interact first think later you know she's definitely all about just put pick it up stretch it bend it twist it set fire to it whatever um and i think i think that that, that can add such an interesting dynamic um for my I, one of the projects i started using oasis foam oh yeah as a brand for the branding model and I've ended up coating it in various layers of paper and yeah <laughs> the Emily, photo Emily, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna that. dive in I'm gonna dive in here and move on all right wow I'm, I've not um I've Let's not told start. Emily was gonna do this so she sent me this because he was like <laughs> how can I model that I haven't got my phone I can't get access to the workshop and he's like well try and go and I've actually got in. how far I've got with it now oh wow there's to dry it so, so what is this foam? Is this like a, oh, wow. a gardening foam, did you say? Wow. Yeah, I've used Oasis and ended up covering it in several layers of paper to, for the paint to actually take to it in the first place. Huh. Cool. So but That's really interesting. Yeah, and, and strangely, I, modeling stage. I, I got into, um, I, I got to publish an article in Make Magazine through doing something very similar to this with Sugru by chance in that I realized that if you put Sugru on foam, it just didn't stick to it. So you need to put uh, basically polyfiller on it and then let it dry, sand it down, and then you skin it with Sugru. And it gave it, you know, I did it for this ergonomic mouse. And, and so I love what you're doing because it, it's, it's definitely that thing of, you know, you're, you're quite right in that you can't buy proper modeling supplies like blue foam or the, the orangey, you know, polyurethane stuff. But I love the fact that obviously that stuff probably is still available on Amazon because it hasn't been cleaned out or it isn't from exotic supplier. Um, so I'd say that's exactly the attitude to go with, with prototyping is just finding whatever you can uh, and, and finding a way to make it work. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if polyfiller is still available on Amazon. Do you know what I mean? It's, sort yes. of, it's probably not depleted just yet. <laughs> Although a lot of DIY is probably going on right now. Is uh, apparently in one of the big high, you know, big stores, DIY stores, the orange one. 
B and Q, well, they might sponsor us. Let's let's go for everything. Let's just name every brand we can. <laughs> Uh, you've, you've got a queue. You've got a queue to get into the online shop, or you can go and view what their stock online. So that that was bizarre. Um, right, Emily, thank you very much for that question. Thanks a lot, Emily. Thank you. That's a great one. Uh, I've got Good a question. I've got another question. It's come from Ben, and I'm asking this on his behalf. Uh, so uh, Ben is admitting that he's got some bad habits of getting fixated on kind of one idea during his ideation phase. So he, he, he comes up with that idea and he thinks, that's it, I'm done now. So, uh, and that affects his development of other ideas. So basically he's asking, how can I avoid and overcome this habit? And it applies to me, possibly to everybody in this virtual room. So how do you avoid I, design fixation, <laughs> I don't, I think that's I think that's an interesting one. And I guess uh, Ben's having to, uh, He's implying that he's not a genius who strikes gold every single time with his first idea. Otherwise, I would be saying, well, just carry on, right? There's no problem. Uh, if I had that turnaround, I'd be happy. But I guess, I guess the interesting thing is that I find even when I'm working on projects where I actually think I've, I've, I've hit something that is, let's say, 80% of the, of the brief, it's interesting to actually sort of almost challenge yourself to be a bit perverse and sometimes go in a different direction. So strangely, the thing that comes to mind to your question is, uh, I'm going to show my age now. You guys probably won't know PJ Harvey, uh, but, but basically awesome singer songwriter. Um, and she always said, you know, when she's having trouble with her sort of creative process where she just can't see how it works, she would try and subtract the thing that she loves most. And that's interesting how that really sort of disrupts your thinking. So I would almost say, you know, let, let's say you design some sort of widget um, and you thought, oh, the best part is the, the LED array. It really, it really brings the whole thing together. Then maybe by removing it, you'll understand whether everything else was functioning to the same level of impact. And indeed, you, I think another example that I think I reviewed uh, a book on uh, I forgot what it's called I think it was like advertising techniques but it's a gray one with lots of little sketches but the reason I love it is because it it, it makes the point that if you're creating a sort of advert an advertisement or a piece of marketing strategy to not get all the sort of really premium photography in just to do sketches lay out the copy understand how it actually plays how it the rhythm all that sort of stuff flows and then by the time you bring all the expensive assets in, it's going to be really strong. So I guess the metaphor of what I'm saying is really make sure the skeleton's good before you build all the, the layers on top of it and, and, and the finish. If that was a good answer, I hope that's useful. Oh, you're muted. Perida. Hi. Uh, thank you very much, Jude. Uh, we've got a follow-up question. I'm going to go to that follow-up question. Ale, thank you. Make sure I'm not muted. Um, okay, to, to follow up on, on Ben's question. Um, so how, how do we approach this? So this could be a problem for us, uh, Jude. You know, uh, students sort of not hitting perfection on the very first go. Um, how, how should we best give feedback to students at that point? And how should they take that feedback? Gosh, uh, I guess I guess it's always that fine line of, of, of understanding when you're in a paid full-time employment and when you're a student is, is, is I think the way I would frame the beginning of this answer because what I'm trying to say is that in all honesty I've been in situations where there's just absolutely no time to do anything but run with the first answer there is, is there's just so little time so little money so little resource that actually you have to say with you know the phrase of put the wings on the plane as you're falling off the cliff is what it gets called, I've heard from a few agencies. And, and I think that's okay. So you end up starting with something and then iterating as you go, but you haven't got this time to do this big, you know, to use the British Council terminology, double diamond expansion. It's almost like you're doing a little series of fits and starts. The interesting point to come back to being a student is I find it hard to believe that it's living quite the same level of pressure. And you might be thinking, well, it's all relative, Jude. You're a professional in a professional environment, but we're still finding this really, really intense and stressful. I would still completely sympathize with that. But most term projects are actually quite a lot longer than most 
real life consultancy pro pro projects actually have for that early ideation phase. So I'd almost say that the more you can test yourself to expand the brief, to go in different directions, to be extremely critical to a point of almost burning what you feel is a good idea, it, it will truly make you understand what works and what doesn't. And I think the trick of that is if you can take pictures, take recordings, do whatever you do to document the process. The, the thing I've said in many of the lectures, and I'll continue to say it, forgive, forgive me if it's a broken record, but I've honestly phoned up quite a few of my friends in making this series and just been like, am I just, you know, confirmation bias of Jude's, Jude's world, am I in a bubble? And they've said, no, honestly, process is king. I'll, I'll take any the two more pages in a folio of someone's process and thinking rather than two more hero shots of stuff where i just can't tell whether it's any good at all or whether they've really inverted contorted changed the brief so so don't get me wrong johnny ive is allowed to have a folio which is just look i've done it isn't it gorgeous but every employer who's looking at you know graduates it's it's all about the process it's all about your thinking that that is why you get the job and i'd say the other thing is don't don't underestimate, you're probably noticing I'm doing it all the time, but bringing in little anecdotes and little stories that give colour. Uh, because it, it's the way that we convince each other that we have actually been there. We've, we've, we've done something that was difficult as opposed to we just got lucky first time. Um, so I think this is something strangely I'm going to go on to, I don't want to steal my thunder, but in the next series of lecture I talk a lot about how you not just communicate a process in a dut 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 way, how do you actually bring a sense of drama and a sense of pacing to what you did? And if you're wondering where I'm getting the experience from, a lot of this was actually learned through doing the BBC Big Life Fix of working with directors who were actively editing and shaping what the public perception of the design process was. So I'm gonna be stealing heavily from some of the tricks of the trade there. Um, so I really hope, uh, dare I say it, I hope that's a useful answer for now. But I would also say stay tuned because you've got uh, three hours expanding on what that is. I look forward to that, Jude. Thanks very much. Okay. Th thanks, Jude. And I want to thank you as well for your sort of narrative through the themes and everything that you've got going on. Because I know Ali asked a bit of a leading question. It's something we're sort of battling with as lecturers, isn't it, continuously? Um, is that I think we're, we're suffering from what happens in sort of design education at GCSE and A-level, where there's a lot of making that goes on. And then they retrospectively look back and then fill in the blanks with a load of sketching of stuff that they were supposed to have done in the initial stages. And I think mm -hmm. what the, the process that we've seen through what you've done with, with your lectures is that, that anything goes. And then actually recording that narrative is so important, isn't it? And all those mock-ups mock and taking photographs of things that are going on, because that's the ideal story, story that gives the whole thing context. So mm -hmm. thanks for that. And thanks for sort of making the whole thing real, the way that we're trying to record uh, design uh, process uh, a lot easier for students hopefully. Yeah and I think maybe I could just share a quick example just to uh, also avail of the technology here that we we have in front of us. Um, I think I've mentioned this, tell me when you can see this guys. Yeah. Uh, oh interestingly it's uh, shared a different aspect of the screen. Let me try one more time. Doo -ba -doo -ba -doo. All right let's try this. Forgive me being a tech doofus. All right, hasn't got it. Right, so here we go. I'm just going to get there anyway. So the thing is, with with this one, I thought was a nice story. Of uh, I mentioned because obviously I was, I was I did this as well as I was doing the videos as well, which is making a DIY cardboard loop the loop. So this is basically a bit of elastic which fires a car all the way around. So I won't play the sound just because I think it'll be a little bit disruptive. Um, but you can see that this thing bombs round, flies through the loop. Now, the point that I want to make is that you can either tell a story of I got some cardboard boxes and then I built the loop the loop because basically I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big immature guy who's got nothing better to do. Or of course you frame the story, which, which that is definitely some of the truth. But I framed it in that I wrote this little bit of a preamble of what it is to be a dad you know, what my sort of, you know, background in childhood was and also his reaction to it. Um, and as you can see, I, I dropped a hint that I did this as part of the lockdown lecture series. And so then I get into the instruction. But the point is, I think the reason this has got quite a few nice shares 
is that it's not really just the sort of, you know, the quality of the documentation, which I think is adequate, but it's not, it's not Dawling Kindersley. It's not, you know, world leading. It's just enough that shows people the flavor of, of how we did it and some basic techniques. But I think the reason people go to this website so much is that usually people do include a little bit of a personal narrative of why they do things. And that for me, this was about sort of understanding, you know, my son better through building things together. And even though, of course, I did the scalpel bits on my own, he was actually helping glue things and stick things. And so I was as much reacting to his process. Um, and so again, I think I shot this little video and you can see it's dark out at night. And this was just me, you know, it wasn't fully finished. This is still just masking tape holding it together before I created the little system with cocktail sticks. And, and the point is, you know, you can see I've got a flask of water because it's late and glue gun and soldering iron. And the point is that, that even though that's just a one minute video, it, it documents the reality of the situation. And I think if you have anything like that, it feels really, really crazy. And I can tell you, I started from exactly the same place with, you know, as any student does, of feeling extremely awkward about talking to a camera. But you do almost have to, have to sort of try and imagine what it would be like. Yeah. And I, I remember with Big Life Fix, I found it so alien that I got, I'd actually just watched uh, Tom Hanks on, I think it was Castaway, and I got a ping pong ball and some blue tack and I drew a little smiley face on it and I put it just above the webcam. And even though I, I was sort of almost like a third person realizing how ridiculous I was doing this, but I almost sort of thought, yeah, but I need it to remind myself to smile. I need it so that every time I see the ping pong ball, I'm like, don't just talk like this, be animated. And so really whatever it takes to sort of hack your brain to just relax about cameras, relax about documenting the process. And at the end of the day, telling a story of something other than you. One of the things I've said continuously about projects is it's nice to design, of course, for a passion project, which is all, all things you enjoy. But I was trying to design this very much around what a four year old is capable of doing. And so as a testament, it was designed so that he can pull back the trigger himself. I didn't just do it and then sort of take a, a carefully poised, you know, uh, photograph to pretend it. I, I made it so he could genuinely use it and play with it himself. Um, so I'd say really in conclusion, it, it, it really is all about the story that makes the documentation come alive. But you'll find that when you do want to give a presentation, if you haven't got all those photos, you end up having these gaps, which then become really hard to retrospectively fit in. So I would say until you become expert, like a director, then just document as much as you can. Because I mean, let's face it, shooting a hundred photos, a thousand photos, it's, it's a 10 pound memory card. It's, it's easy, just, just save it. Um, I've got an extra question that's just come in and I think it's kind of relevant really. So th again, thank you, Jude. So um, the question is from Simon, but I'm gonna ask it. Um, and obviously we've got a lot of students now graduating and wanting to find work and going into that work environment where everything is different to what we, they expected. Um, but the question is, are physical portfolios relevant in the real job interview as a, in a real job interview, or should everything be online on a website and LinkedIn? So, oh man, yeah, like um, this is, I love I, that I don't question. Want to you, but you've got five minutes, dude. <laughs> okay, well, in some ways, that's that's a really interesting answer. And I ended up uh, going out to, to Apple uh, to, to possibly end up working out there. Um, and in the end, for a whole host of reasons, which is for discussions another day, but I didn't end up taking the job which for me was, was the right decision. And I was very happy with the fact that I got to run a team uh, at Sugru instead, which, which I think for me at the right stage of my career was more important. Um, but the thing I loved about that and the reason I, I'm, I'm name dropping Apple deliberately is that of course it sets a high bar, but they were very big on bringing along the physical prototype. And I'm pretty sure the reason I even got, you know, all the way through all that was because, you know, I, I don't want to sort of give away what they do because I think there's an important need for secrecy to not tell you exactly what the question is. Because I think at the end of the day, they want to test you in a, in a genuine situation, not just, oh, I knew what you did and I'll copy it. But that I brought along this little model, you know, flew it all the way out to Cupertino and was like, look, this is, this is how it works. And it was made with just some little magnets, some little bits of strips, styrofoam plastic, uh, a couple of bits of rubber and a little spring and you've got no idea what it is and that's the fun of it but 
but the point is it worked and i think the difference between doing a bunch of cad and you know a, a, a you know degrees of movement model and an animation is that if you're there saying look i made the mechanism here it is check it out they can't help but play with it and interact with it and it just always brings a smile so i would say and i i know that was exactly the same at dyson uh if you you know people who brought in a thing and said check it out what do you think that that hands down and it's not that i'm trying to speak for apple or dyson and things may have changed in the human resources project but i just feel like even jobs aside it's so much more fun if someone comes along and says this is it this is the thing check it out it's it's impossible not to love it mike again Perida. Thank you, Jude. Uh, I'm aware of the time. I've had a cracking question from Katie, so I'm just going to look. Can we keep that till next one, Katie? And I think it, it might fit in better next time, but it, it's a cracking question. suspense. We've got a cliffhanger. Definitely too big of a question <laughs> for two minutes. <laughs> Ab yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you one final question, and I want everybody to think about this because um, we are, we are drawing to a close. We've got no credits. We've got no, get out music so it'll be once we're done we've kind of done and that's what i don't like about these online meetings this is like Whoa. so um everybody consider and if you want post your answers in the group chats please it would be nice and i think and i think from zoom chats we get to save these as a, as a text file so it would be good um if you could have invented one thing jude that's in existence what would it be and then why so if everybody considers that question as well, and while Jude is going to regale us with his answer, if you could put something in the group chat, that would be awesome. And then thank you very much for tuning in and joining us for the next one. Over to Jude. That's that's a good bit of uh, buying me some time there, Perida. Uh, <laughs> I guess I guess the thing that um, comes to mind for me, and, and I guess it's sort of the the thing the thing that I always get excited about is stuff where it's 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 technically incredible and it also has some other function and so for me the the one that i sort of always been very inspired by is the the biro pen or the bic crystal as it's sometimes known because when you think about it you've got this absolutely microscopically tiny perfect sphere that somehow is just in a socket with just enough tolerance for ink to flow around it and it not jam and I'm a bit of a nerd in that I actually read, this is going to sound really nerdy, but as a designer, honestly, I think this is the trademark of most people I've met is you go down rabbit holes. And so I read about the history of the ballpoint pen. And I, I kid you not, it's, it's like movie making amount of jeopardy. There's like deceit, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's backstabbing, there's all sorts of stuff colliding with wars, there's politics, there's in, internal turmoil and drama. But the point is, I guess the reason I love the, the ballpoint pen so much is that not only is it incredibly, you know, uh, efficient in its engineering, the, the aesthetics are rather lovely, even the fact that it's got that hexagonal profile so it doesn't roll as much. But also when you consider the, 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 the sort of profound nature of the fact that in some places in the world, if you do not have a pen, you can't go to school, you can't get an education. And so the fact that you can make this thing that unlocks the potential for someone's life for, for, for pennies or cents, I think it's really, really hard to beat that for me as an example. Um, but I guess ultimately that's my perception. And I guess that for me sort of says a bit about my values and what I think design is there to do for society. But I would say I'm a long way off even achieving anything close to that. So it's, uh, I both love it, but it intimidates me in, in the same breath. Thank you. And let, let's get another brand in. What's your favorite? Is, is it the Bic, your favorite brand of Bic? Sponsored, sponsored by Bic. Damn, I picked the wrong one there. <laughs> uh, I, I do particularly like a Parker today. <laughs> there we go. Right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, th thank you very much. I'd like to thank Jude for joining us. Uh, oh, Alice, classic Bic pen. Um, if you, yes, these comments are coming in thick and fast, so brilliant, keep them coming in. Um, check out the events page on Facebook, 
and the YouTube channel of Jude for the next videos. And I think we'll be doing another one of these at the end of the process. Yeah, Jude? Absolutely. Can't wait. So thank you very much, people. Feel free to leave. Uh, I think we're hanging around for a bit. Um, I'll be the last to leave, as all good hosts should be. So thank you very much, people. Indeed. No, thank you so much for having me, guys. And as I said, it's been a real pleasure uh, working on this. And, and, and I think as always, I mean, I've kind of said this before, but it's just, it's always interesting going into a new process, which this certainly has been. So, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to read these. I'm just going to fill some yeah. time. Uh, we've got uh, CD player. <laughs> I know. Cable ties. Yeah. Wheel. Ah, I read, I was reading this week, the wheel was first used for the, for the uh, pottery wheel in ah. uh, Mesopotamia. And it was about three centuries until somebody put it on a cat. There you go. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, SpaceX, the wheel. Whilst you're, whilst you're doing that as well, can I thank Predir for organising this as well and for Jude for partaking as well on behalf of us all. Absolutely brilliant series of lectures and everything. Absolutely timely, perfect use of resources and, as well. And, and with the conference not happening as well, it's, 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 it's brilliant. So thanks all on behalf of us all, I think. So thank you. Thank you. Cool. Just to show my tech embracing, I've given you a round of applause there, Perida. Oh, I missed that one. Do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Younger people watching going, God, embarrassing themselves. <laughs> but I think, I think, you know, as I said, fair play. You literally went from not using Zoom much to running this, which is, for anyone who's had to do it, is actually quite a step up in terms of effort and complexity. So, uh, yeah, thank you for me as well. It's been great. And I, I might have a space scene in the back next time. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the you've got the genuine article of the board here with the uh, the scribbles. I think, I think you've just that's a virtual background. That is Jude. I don't think that that's is it. Not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, phone screen, the glass part, the uh, combustion engine. Uh, we get a ping when everybody leaves, but we've still got thirty one people in the room. It's good. <laughs> I'll tell you the one thing I wish I did have is is air conditioning because it it's absolutely baking me in here. <laughs> but you need it for the sound that's the trouble yeah so now you'll hear all the birds tweeting and possibly my son boing in around outside <laughs> i can hear the birds yes yep Toyota makes his pillar drill <laughs> yeah no but thanks uh Alad and, and dewey as well it's uh it's a real real pleasure to do this and i think it's quite exciting that we've turned this around so quickly because it would be easy to polish this and then lose a month. Um, and I think, you know, it's credit to, to Peridot really just cracking on and just, just saying, yeah, you know, go for it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's a great alternative way of working actually. And, and, and I'm a bit, I know we've had loads and loads of years one and two. It's a shame that year three aren't here listening because they're putting <laughs> stuff in at the moment with the crits. And we've had loads of issues as regards recording their thinking and everything and how they're going to prototype and test and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, it's uh, quite timely, really. Um, yeah. Have we, record, have we recorded this? Well, we, we have recorded it, but of course yeah. we don't want to uh, over mention that or no one will turn up live and ask questions. So yeah. uh, for those of you who are still here, I hope you still turn yeah, up in well, a couple of we've weeks. We've got a meeting with you three tomorrow morning, so I might send them in this direction or get a link set up and then they can have, have a listen to this because I think a lot of their answers would be, you know, questions to be answered uh, looking yeah. at this, definitely. So thanks. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the weird irony, isn't it? We find ourselves in, in COVID, but actually a lot of the questions feel universal. Yeah, it, it's like, how do I make sense of things? How do I prototype when I haven't either got all the resources or all the connections or all the you know, ability to do something? Yeah. There's, there's a limited palette always on any project, you know, yeah. uh, and indeed sometimes they become the best. I wanted to dive in on daisies earlier as well, because I know that she's got issues with sort of prosthetics and things and about, you know, taking a, um, a casting or making a last of somebody's limbs as well. I was thinking, you know, whilst you were talking, I was thinking, you know, you could put something over over um, your limb and then you could actually have some, you know, foam and then put it into a tube and then make a casting for you and then send that back. You know, as a cast, there's lots of different yeah. 
options that you could do. And, you know, well, I'm just trying to think if she's actually working with somebody like what, or an individual that she can ask them to do that for. Is, is Daisy still here, actually? Daisy's I don't know if you can line. tell. Can you yeah. see? Yeah, yeah. Well, she, she's still here. So yeah, something else just came <laughs> to mind um, that, that wasn't on the uh, original, original thing. Let me see if mm -hmm. uh, I, I've got it. Why not? Let's let's just do Daisy, it. Daisy, do you do you know the do you know the person who um you're have you dealing with a specific client here or a number of clients? Um, not at the minute. My my idea was to try and refine my design and technology, and once I've got sort of a final design, then approach uh one client to build one specifically for that for them for testing. Might be worth you approaching people to see if you can get them to make molds of themselves and send those to you. So you, when you send them a prototype, then it yeah. would be a little bit more usable for them. So this this is what I was talking about, actually. Uh, forgive me for not showing it earlier, but uh, this 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 was the, the grid technique that I used. Um, and I took one that were more accurate because actually these were the original ones. And I went, oh, I should I should actually take it from above so that I've got something to, to, to bring into CAD in SOLIDWORKS. Um, but the bit that, I'm just trying to look whether I've got the damn photo, uh, which is frustrating if I haven't. But the, the funniest thing is that I wanted to show you, are you familiar with something called um, agar jelly? No. So it's a seaweed based thing. Right, okay. Uh, and, and basically you just buy a pack of it, mix it with water. Ah, here we go. So these tubs, if you imagine them upside down, mm. were, were filled with basically a, a seaweed plaster, so, uh, sorry, a seaweed resin that you mm. mix with water. It's really, really easy. And so you just get them a container and say, put your limb inside it whilst this stuff goes off. And it goes from liquid pour in, push mm. the, the stump in, and then wait for about five minutes, literally five, and mm. then it's set. And then the key thing is to cast the plaster straight away because the downside with seaweed is that uh the, the plus side is that it goes really quick but then it also shrinks and changes so asking them to pour it within 24 hours before it starts shrinking means i had these four perfect models of, of kyle's mm -hmm. arm in different directions and mm -hmm. then if i wanted to i could do all sorts of fancy 3d scanning but i didn't need to in the end because i took so many measurements off this yeah. Um, and as much as that is not an easy thing to ship right now, you're going to lose seven to 10 days, as I say. Um, I think it's still quite remarkable that you will get it in time. Okay. Um, yeah, that was it. So alginate. I think agar is another type of seaweed, but this is the, the, the excuse me, trade name is alginate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, I hope that's useful. Yeah, definitely. Oh, right. Well, I think everybody's just hanging on now. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> well, I think that's uh, it. Unless we're going to do a little dance, then uh, uh, I think... I'll, 